Have you ever wondered what would happen if you programmed life, locked it inside a simulation, and let it evolve? Me too. Let's see what happens. First, we need an environment. To simulate this, we essentially just need a space which is capable of tracking data at specified points. We're going to use hexagons because that's what bees use and bees are. Pretty smart. We'll grow some mountains and some rivers and use those along with map position to calculate temperature and precipitation. Once we have those, we can use the Whittaker biome system to assign each tile its own biome. Biomes range from rainforest to desert to tundra and contain three resources that creatures are interested in. Plant food, meat, and water. Plant food grows over time until it reaches a critical mass. Meat accumulates as creatures die, but decays over time. And water ranges from zero to infinite depending on its proximity to rivers. Creatures spend their days wandering around based on a priority system that tracks hunger, thirst, and love. Hunger and thirst build over time based on a creature's diet, metabolic rate, and level of activity. Creatures will wait until they reach reproductive maturity and, if love is their current priority, they'll seek a suitable mate. Creatures will consume everything they need from the tile they currently occupy. If that tile runs out, they'll look at adjacent tiles, pick one, and move on. Finally, this is an evolution simulator, so of course we have mutations. Each time a creature reproduces, there's a 1 in 3 chance of a mutation occurring. A mutation will cause one stat to move up or down by up to 30%. The stats that can change in this simulation are size, speed, rate of reproduction, and diet. The simulation runs on the basis of turns, which you can think of as nondescript amounts of time during which each creature is able to take one action. At their starting values, creatures live for a thousand turns and take roughly three turns to travel between tiles. Creatures cannot take any action while moving and will leave a trail of scent which lasts several turns and can be tracked by both predators and potential mates. In the future, I'll be adding many more animal avatars, but for now, we just have bears. This means that just because two creatures look the same, that doesn't necessarily mean they're the same species. However, there are a few things to look out for. Herbivores will always appear as pandas, carnivores will always appear as polar bears, and omnivores will be one of the others depending on their stats. Anyway, let's get started. We're going to spawn some creatures into an environment that we like. This one looks pretty cool. We'll start with a population of 18 creatures and just a single species. As the creatures gain a foothold, let's think about the environment we've put them in. It's small, meaning a creature could essentially travel the entire map several times over its life. There's very little desert, which means creatures should have relatively easy access to food and water. And there are no islands, which means that everything will be competing with everything. Take a moment to think about what might happen. Bonus points for any theories on why something did or didn't turn out the way you expected. In the early stages, the population expands rapidly, taking advantage of a fertile environment with no competition. As you might expect, this means that there isn't a lot of evolutionary pressure on creatures. So it might be some time before we see any major evolutionary changes, right? Hmm, we're only a few generations in, and there's already some genetic variation amongst the omnivores. More surprising, we already have our first carnivores, which means that multiple rounds of mutations needed to occur. So why did this happen? There are basically three possibilities. One, it's just coincidence. Two, being a carnivore is just a really good strategy in this environment. Or three, which has to do with how natural selection works more conceptually, and which I think is the most likely. We tend to think of creatures adapting to their environment, but that's not right at all. Creatures are what they are, and as new, different creatures are born, the population adapts to its environment because creatures that have beneficial mutations survive and reproduce, but creatures that have detrimental mutations do not. However, because we started with a blank slate, we have a scenario where everything survives regardless of whether a mutation is beneficial or detrimental. This means we get quite a bit of genetic diversity in a relatively short period of time. Anyway, this phenomenon is short-lived, and now that the population is steadied, we should start to see a drift towards an ideal mix of traits for this environment. This is the longest of our three epochs, spanning nearly 150,000 turns. The number of generations will vary widely with species, but on average I would expect it to be in the region of 500 to 750 generations. During this time, three things happen. First, the population increases steadily, as does the genetic diversity in this environment. Second, we see herbivores dominate, which is a few omnivores and virtually no carnivores for the entire period. I have to admit, I found this a little bit surprising. For one thing, predators have it pretty easy in this environment because I have yet to write any code for prey to defend themselves. This means that if one creature is bigger than another, and it wants to eat the other, there's nothing the other can do to defend itself. It just gets eaten. Also, predators generally don't need to eat as often as herbivores. This is why you hear about lions spending 20 hours a day asleep, but you basically never see a cow that isn't eating. We've simulated this by simply scaling hunger with diet. So again, it's surprising to see predators do so poorly. The preference for being vegan might be to do with the fact that we picked an environment with very few arid regions. This means that plant food is highly available and that meat decays quite quickly. That said, it's important to note that the purpose of simulations, especially at this level, is not to provide answers as such. Real ecosystems are immensely complicated, and I'm just some guy on the internet. The goal is to provide trackable insights based on certain conditions which can, to some degree, be extrapolated into the real world. I'm not sure we're there yet, but fingers crossed. In the meantime, I'd be interested to hear any theories about why Epoch 2 turned out this way. One final thing to note is that two-thirds of the way through Epoch 2, the population made a dramatic switch. 
favoring smaller size with a slightly slower rate of reproduction and faster speed. To me, this indicates that the creatures are optimizing only for competition with other herbivores. And that leads us into Epoch 3. One thing we should always bear in mind is that an environment is not just the world we put a creature in. It includes the creature itself. When we started, we essentially had a box that was full of untouched fruit and veg. Now, we have a box that's full of partially eaten fruit and veg, and an untapped population of defenseless walking meat bags. And this leads us to the most dramatic series of changes we'll see. The number of predatory creatures skyrockets over just 10,000 turns, causing the mass extinction of virtually every herbivorous creature on the map. These are primarily omnivores, but we see a sharp rise in specialist carnivores as well. The creatures enter into an evolutionary arms race which is defined almost entirely by size, which, if you remember, is the only defense against predation. However, just like in the real world, a population of giant predatory creatures is not sustainable, and it collapses even more quickly than it arose. This leads to a resurgence in the herbivore population, and a subsequent return to the stats we saw earlier on. Finally, after 300,000 turns, the simulation terminates, though these blips made me wonder whether, if it had run longer, would we have seen a repeatable pattern? I thought it was quite interesting to see what appears to have been the start of a cycle where a population controls itself through predation, but there we go. To sum up, we started with a population of omnivores. They expanded quickly, trending towards a herbivorous diet probably as a result of a highly productive environment. This strategy was successful for the majority of our simulation, other than for a brief and dramatic period that was defined by predation, which may have been the result of over-specialization in the herbivore population. There's probably more, so let me know if you saw anything interesting. Also, full disclosure, I don't have a degree in biology, or computer science, or any of these things. So if you see a mistake, let me know and I'll try and fix it in version 2. Anyway, these videos take a really long time to make. I create 99% of the content from scratch, including art, code, graphics, animations, and more. It's fun, but I'd like to optimize my time as much as possible, and YouTube won't let me do polls until I have more subscribers. So, you know, click the buttons.